Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, so as the title suggests, um, I'm going to talk about snakes. I really love snakes. I think they're extremely cool. I've always been very passionate about them. A lot of people don't like snakes very much, and that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but what I hope to convince you of by the end of tonight is that snakes are not as bad as a lot of people think, OK? And if you're afraid of snakes, maybe I can convince you by the end of the night that they're not actually as scary as, as maybe you think that they are, OK? Um, but first, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about what I think makes snakes so cool and interesting. Um, snakes are reptiles, and they actually evolved from lizards, another group of reptiles, about 170 million years ago during the Jurassic period. So there's the Jurassic, time of the dinosaurs. They're actually the youngest group of living reptiles. And we know this because we are now beginning to accumulate a really nice series of transitional fossils like this one. So here's a snake fossil, here's his body, and here in this box and blown up here is a tiny little leg. So you can see here he's got a, an upper leg bone, a femur, two lower leg bones there, a tibia and fibula, and then some tiny little foot bones. And some modern snakes actually have vestiges of these legs too. So this is a ball python, and a lot of pythons have these what are called spurs, and um, they're actually vestigial hind legs. They have a different function now. But this is evidence that they once um, were legged, and, and so they evolved from lizards. In fact, in a very um, strict sense, they are lizards. And that might be a little confusing, but to help you understand it, I have drawn this simplified snake family tree. So what I mean is that snakes are actually more closely related to some groups of lizards, like this, these groups here, including Gila monsters and iguanas, than they are to other groups of lizards, like geckos and skinks. So if these would be maybe their siblings, these are like their distant cousins, OK? Um, what you might not know is that actually a whole lot of other groups of lizards have also lost their legs. We think that leglessness has evolved 30, maybe 40 times within lizards. So you've got legless geckos, legless skinks, pretty much every group except for the iguanas have some legless representatives, okay? So now maybe you're thinking, well, gee, what makes snakes so special? Why do they get a special name? Why don't we just call them, you know, lizards? Um, so there are some things that are different about snakes. One is that they're really diverse. Snakes are by far the most diverse group of legless lizards. Um, they're also the oldest group of legless lizards. They probably evolved before any of these other groups, and that might be one of the reasons for their success. And there are some morphological differences too. So here's a garter snake on the right, and here are two different types of lizards on the left. Um, one thing you can see is that this lizard on top has eyelids that it can blink, okay, just like ours. Snakes um, don't have eyelids, or maybe a better way of thinking about it is that they do have eyelids that are always closed, okay? But they're see-through, they can see out of them. So they have this clear scale covering and protecting their eye called a spectacle. And that's different from a lot of groups of legless lizards, not all, but a lot. Another thing is their tongue. So this lizard is licking its eyeball, and um, it's got sort of a blob-like fleshy tongue that's not terribly different from yours or mine. In contrast, snakes have a long forked tongue it's got two long pointy tips that they use for smelling. And a, a, you know, not many legless lizards have this characteristic either. Thirdly, um, most snakes lack an external ear opening. You can see the external ear openings on these two lizards here, but the snake doesn't have one. And so these characteristics together kind of help separate snakes from other groups of legless lizards. There's a few other things. Um, snakes are pretty much the only um, legless lizards to shed their skin all in a single step, okay? Most shed in small bits and pieces, kind of like we do. Um, but snakes shed it in one huge piece. They also have some pretty interesting internal anatomy. They have very elongate internal organs, like these long kidneys right here that are staggered with one in front of the other instead of side by side. And they just have a single lung. So their right lung is their functional lung takes up a lot of their body when it's inflated, and they have a tiny vestigial left lung. Other groups of legless lizards also have a reduced left lung. Some have it switched, they have a reduced right lung and a functional left lung, and some legless lizards have both lungs functional. Um, but the, all snakes have this, only the right lung is functional. Um, and then the last thing that really makes snakes interesting and unique, at least in my opinion, is that they have very, very kinetic skulls. Okay, so what I mean by that is that their skull is really, really flexible. 
You might have heard people say that snakes can unhinge their jaws before. That's not actually really true. They don't actually take their skull apart when they're eating something, but their skull is just super stretchy. Their chin is not connected uh, by bone. It's just by ligament, so it can stretch really wide. They kind of have an extra bone in their upper jaw that they can use to make their gape of their mouth really wide. And so they can eat things that are much, much bigger than they are. Okay, and all snakes are carnivores. Okay, there aren't any snakes anywhere out there that eat plants or fungi or anything like that. Some of them, like this egg-eating snake, eat eggs. And this picture gives you a really good idea of just how stretchy not only their heads, but their skin and their entire bodies are. They just eat these massive meals. And we'll talk a little bit more about what snakes eat later on in the talk. But this is something, they can eat things that are much, much bigger relative to their own body size than any other group of, of legless lizards. Okay, so, I'll talk a little bit about the diversity of snakes. There are three major groups of snakes throughout the world. The first is these blind snakes or worm snakes. Um, we actually have one species here in Utah, in southern Utah. If you're down in southern Utah, maybe doing some gardening around St. George, you might turn up one of these. They're not totally blind, but they have tiny little eyes that are covered by a scale. And a lot of them live in ant or termite mounds where they eat the larvae and the pupae of, of ants and termites, okay? These are not well known. Most people don't even know that they exist, or if they do have seen one, they maybe think it's a worm or something like that. But they're out there and they are snakes. The second group is a bit more familiar. These are kind of colloquially called the boas and pythons. There's a few other groups in here. Um, and we actually have a representative here in Utah, the rubber boa. So this is one of our more common snakes here in northern Utah. Um, really interesting snake, it's a true boa, relatively closely related to like a boa constrictor from South America. This is not a super diverse group, but a lot of these have some of those vestigial um, back limbs like I was mentioning before. The third group um, is by far the most diverse. It includes probably the vast majority of all snakes that you've ever heard of and certainly the vast majority of all snake species that are out there. Um, it includes all the venomous snakes, including things like rattlesnakes, cobras. It includes a lot of colubrid, um, not, you know, sort of non-venomous snakes like milk snakes, and then some weirder groups like this file snake, okay? And this is like 80% of all, all snake species. In total, uh, snakes are really widely distributed. They're found on all continents except Antarctica. Um, they're not really found in the polar regions, but they're pretty much everywhere else on land. There's a few places like Ireland, New Zealand that don't have any. And there's sea snakes found all throughout the Indian and Pacific Oceans, not in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so they're, they're practically worldwide, pretty darn close. Um, as of today, there's 3,571 described valid species of snakes. This number goes up and down a lot, but mostly it goes up. Um, it, since 2010, there's been about 160 new species of snakes described, which is an awful lot. And it's really amazing how quickly we're discovering new species of snakes. The last decade was the biggest, the second biggest decade ever for new snake species being named, which is really quite cool. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One is that we're exploring more remote tropical areas where diversity is really high uh, in a way that we haven't really been able to before. And the other is that we're now able to use DNA, um, which is a, a something that scientists didn't have access to for most of the time that they were naming and describing snakes to describe and identify different species that look really similar but might actually qualify as, as being different. So this number is probably gonna continue to grow for quite some time. And I'm really happy about that. I think we could make it to 4,000 snakes at some point, you know, maybe even a little bit higher. So we'll see. Okay, in Utah, um, there's about 30 species of snakes in Utah, okay? So it's fairly diverse. This map shows the diversity of snake species at any particular point. So the brighter colors are more diverse, the, the more blue colors are less diverse. As you can see, most of the snakes are found down in the southwestern corner of the state around St. George. That's where the Mojave Desert ecoregion enters our state. And there's a lot of species of reptiles that are only found in the Mojave or in areas further south, okay? Um, I should have mentioned, so worldwide, probably between 20 and 30% of those species of snakes are dangerously venomous to humans. So a relatively small proportion. And in Utah, it's about the same. Of those 30 species, there's only five that are, that are dangerous to humans. Um, so I'll, I'll mention some of those in just a second. Uh, so, but what I wanna emphasize is that of those 30 species, 25 of them are totally harmless to humans, okay? Um, and I encourage you to learn them and to know the difference because you'll, um, you'll be better for it, I suggest. In northern Utah, so Cache County, where we are right now, we've got about eight species of snakes that are normally seen. I already mentioned the rubber boa. Um, there are also a couple species um, 
of more day active snakes, so rubber boas are mostly found out at night. This species, the racer, is, is diurnal. It's active during the day. It's very, very fast, so it's, it's aptly named. So if you're hiking in an area with grass and you see a snake dart away from you really quickly, racer is probably a good guess. Um, there's a few species that are less commonly seen. The night snake is a species that, as its name suggests, only comes out at night, so people rarely see these. Um, the smooth green snake is another species that people rarely see. It's very beautiful, brightly colored, but it spends most of its time underground or underneath rocks or logs or something like that. And so people don't really see these very often. Um, we've also got two species of garter snakes. Most people are at least somewhat familiar with garter snakes. These are our most common snakes. Ironically, the wandering garter snake is a little more common than the common garter snake in our part of the country, but the common garter snake is more widespread overall, so that's where they get their names. Um, and you'll be able to see some of these on display right afterwards, and I think maybe a rubber boa as well. Um, there's also the bull or gopher snake. Oh gosh, that's much darker than I had anticipated. Is that okay? Um, so bull or gopher snakes, and another common name for these in Utah is the blow snake. I'd never heard blow snake until I came to Utah, but it's a good name. These snakes, um, sometimes uh, when they're threatened, they'll hiss really loudly, so they'll blow air out of their, out of their windpipe and make a really loud hiss. Uh, and then finally, we've got the one species of rattlesnake, the Great Basin rattlesnake, that's found around northern Utah. Okay? These two are kind of commonly confused, but they shouldn't be if people knew how to identify snakes um, a little bit better. They don't actually look that similar to one another, especially not to me. Um, people are often really interested in the venomous snakes, and so I'll just talk a little bit more about the rattlesnake species of Utah. So those are our only venomous snakes, are the, the rattlesnakes. Um, we've got five species, and again, same sort of map showing the density of species the highest in the southwest. Most of the state just has a single species. Um, the most widespread species here is split into two what are called subspecies. So I already mentioned the Great Basin Rattlesnake, which is the one in Cache County and also found sort of on the western side of the main mountain range in Utah in the Great Basin ecoregion. On the other side in the Colorado Plateau, is a subspecies called the midget faded rattlesnake, which is a small species that has kind of a more faded pattern. Um, and together, these are known as the western rattlesnake. That's the name for the species, okay? So it's a little bit confusing, but you've got two subspecies in Utah. Um, formerly, there was a third subspecies, this guy, the prairie rattlesnake, who looks pretty similar in the southeastern part of the state. But probably about 15 years ago, um, a study showed that these were genetically distinct enough from these to be elevated to a separate species status. One thing that is a little bit confusing to people, the western rattlesnake, is not the same thing as a western diamondback rattlesnake, okay? A lot of people will tell you that we have western diamondback rattlesnakes in Utah, and it's just not true, okay? You can see the range of a western diamondback right here. They kind of get a little bit close to the southwestern corner of the state there, but they're still, you know, maybe 100 miles away. Um, so these are not actually found in Utah. Anyone that tells you they saw one in Utah um, didn't, unless they saw it in a zoo or something like that. Um, what they probably saw were one of these next two species. So Western Diamondback has these black and white rings around the base of its tail. It's called a coon tailing. And some of the other species that we have in the southwestern corner of the state also have this. So the Mojave, or green rattlesnake, also has some black and white coon tailing right there, um, but it's not the same thing as a western diamondback rattlesnake. There's also this beautiful creature, the speckled rattlesnake, which comes in two distinct color morphs, kind of a red and more of a blue, and they have a bit of black and white at the base of their tail as well. And then finally, our cutest rattlesnake, the sidewinder, is also the smallest. He's got these adorable little horns over both of his eyes, and these guys really like um, very sandy areas where they can burrow in the sand and they ambush their prey from beneath the sand and they're just, they're really cool. Probably my favorite rattlesnake in case that wasn't already obvious. So those are our five rattlesnake species that are native to Utah, okay? Um, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk just a little bit about some of the most recent developments in snake biology, some things that I think are really interesting. This is a question that I spend an awful lot of my time thinking about. So what the, do snakes spend most of their time doing? Okay, And until relatively recently, maybe 20 years ago, we didn't have a very good answer to this question because they're really hard to find and they're really hard to follow. They're excellent at hiding and so they're really good at hiding from snake biologists. Okay, It's really hard for us to find them and then relocate th relocating one that you've already found is next to impossible. 
Um, but we've had some technological advances in the last 20 years that have enabled us to do some things that we weren't able to do before. And so the answer to this question, what we found is basically they spend most of their time sitting in one spot doing nothing. <laughs> So sounds like kind of a boring answer, but it, it's actually not, and I'll get into that more in just a second. Um, occasionally, though, they do do other things. So in temperate areas, and if it's cold, they might go hibernate. Uh, certain times of year, spring or sometimes fall, they might go mate. Uh, if they've mated, they may eventually give birth. Uh, not necessarily right away. They can delay that for a really long time, which is pretty cool. Uh, sometimes they eat, although because they eat things that are so large, they don't really have to eat all that often. Some snakes only eat once or twice a year, which is really amazing. And a lot of female snakes don't eat at all when they're pregnant, which just sounds awful. But they're able to, to do that because their, um, their metabolism is so efficient. And then if they eat, eventually they'll poop at some point. And, and then also they'll, they'll shed their skin on a relatively regular basis. And we've learned these things by using this technology. Um, these are radio transmitters. So basically, this is a little tiny transmitter, and it's sort of surrounded by epoxy or something. And it's got an antenna. You can put these. This is the same concept as like a radio collar that you might put on a deer or some other type of wildlife. But instead of a collar, which would slip right off of a snake, right? these are surgically implanted into the body cavity of a snake. And they're not very big, so the battery doesn't last that long. Some of them last a couple weeks. Some may last a couple months. On a large snake, like an adult rattlesnake, you might get a battery that could last a year. Okay? But what we can do is these send out a signal, and then you can pick that up using a receiver and an antenna like this one. So it's a handheld thing. You just walk around and listen for the beeps. Um, I was going to bring one tonight, but I actually couldn't locate one um, in time. So I'm sorry about that. But this is a really useful technology for learning what snakes do, because it allows you to relocate them very precisely and very accurately. Sometimes I wonder if snakes that are being radio telemetered um, are, are just perplexed by the ability of these humans to repeatedly locate them day after day. It's like, how, how, does he keep, how does he know where I'm here, you know? But, um, but we've been able to learn a lot about their lives this way, and I think that's, that's one of the coolest new things, relatively new at least, in, um, in snake biology. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you is a little bit of data that were collected by a friend of mine on Great Basin rattlesnakes in Idaho. So this blue line is showing the path of a snake and it's connecting different points in space where the snake was located using radio telemetry. So the snake hibernated here, came out of hibernation and moved down into this river valley. And now it's kind of making short distance movements between different locations where it's sitting in one spot for days at a time. Okay. Um, seems weird, but that's how they forage. That's what they do. Is this is um, a sit and wait predator, a predator that just kind of sits in one spot, waits for a prey to come by, and then attacks it. Uh, and what you can see is that at the end of the summer, in the fall, it moves right back up the slope to the exact same spot where it spent the previous winter. Here's another example in yellow coming from a different hibernation site. And the pattern is going to be more or less the same. Okay? Um, so this is what most, at least, rattlesnakes in temperate areas, which are some of the best studied snakes um, at this point, do with their lives. Okay? So he's moving up and down this river valley. And the males will sometimes move greater distances than the females because they're hoping to cross the path of a female. And then they may be able to, to mate with her. But they're really good at finding their way almost right back to the same spot. And you kind of get the idea there's two more tracks that basically do slightly different variations. But they're really good at finding the same places year after year, which is cool. OK, so I mentioned that their foraging strategy is sort of sitting in one spot doing nothing. So this snake doesn't look like it's doing anything, but it, it's, it's foraging. It's waiting for a prey item to come by. And so this is a really successful strategy that's used by a lot of animals. Um, it's a kind of a humorous example from the spider world, but they kind of have a similar, similar type of strategy. Um, and so it's, it's amazing. I mean, if you had to sit in one spot for three days, like if I told you right now you can't leave this room for three days, that'd be kind of a problem, right? You didn't bring enough resources with you into this room to survive on for three days. But if you were all snakes, it'd be no problem at all. Um, OK, so, so what do snakes mostly eat when they're foraging? And, um, Again, kind of a humorous example. So the answer is, in general, other animals, OK? And I love this cartoon because it's just like, dang, you know, the phone always rings when you're halfway through swallowing that gigantic pig. I don't even know how he would answer the phone if he didn't have a pig in his mouth because he doesn't have, he's a snake, he has no arms. <laughs> or why does his armchair have armrests? I don't know. Don't ask these things, OK? Um, but so in general, they eat other animals, right? I mentioned they're all carnivores. There aren't any snakes that eat plants or fungi. Um, but the diversity of animals that they can eat are just incredible. 
Um, I mentioned the blind snakes earlier that eat ant and termite larvae. Um, there's lots of other snakes that eat different types of invertebrates. Here's a snake eating a really nasty venomous centipede. Um, lots of snakes eat vertebrates. They eat fish. They eat all different kinds of amphibians, including toxic amphibians like toads that are chemically defended. They eat other reptiles like lizards. They eat other snakes. They eat birds. Um, they eat lots of mammals. Here's a Puerto Rican boa catching bats out of the air in the mouth of a bat cave. Um, an eastern diamondback eating a rabbit. They can eat really huge mammals. Like here's an Australian python eating a kangaroo. Here's an African python eating some kind of huge antelope. And this one's amazing. This is a photograph from the inside of an African python that was killed. And those are quills from a giant porcupine, okay? <laughs> so I don't know how you swallow a porcupine, but I think the answer is very carefully. <laughs> um, a few more kind of specific and fascinating examples. Here's one that I really like. This is a snail, uh, snail eating snake from Southeast Asia. And these are cool because they have asymmetrical jaws. So because the snails that they eat have shells that coil in a particular direction, their jaws are longer and have more teeth on one side than they do on the other so that they can reach farther into that, sna into that snail shell and pull out that snail's body. Um, here's a, a South American cat-eyed snake eating some frog eggs, which are just this really gooey, like gloppy meal. Um, they've shown that these frog eggs can hatch really, really rapidly in response to predation by a snake. They can detect those very particular vibrations. Um, Here's an African egg-eating snake eating a bird egg. Um, it's a hard-shelled egg that they are amazingly able to get their skull around. They swallow it, and then they crack the shell using these downward-pointing spines on their, on their spine, on the underside of their vertebrae. They let all the, uh, yeah, the yolk and the, and the white run down into their stomach, and then they throw up the shell because it doesn't have very much in the way of nutrition. This guy, a turtle-headed sea snake, has this neat little beak for scraping fish eggs off of coral, which is what they eat. And then finally, a shout out to some Utah State research. So I mentioned a lot of snakes eat very highly toxic amphibians that are chemically defended. So we've got this Japanese tiger keelback, and here's a garter snake eating a rough-skinned newt. And these snakes are eating amphibians that would kill people if we were to eat them. That newt might have enough toxin to kill 50 people. And these snakes can eat them with, um, with no problem. And so and these, these are things that were discovered by researchers that are working in the biology department here um, at Utah State, Butch Brody and Al Savitsky. So really just, there's almost, the sky's the limit to what snakes can eat. There aren't any snakes that eat elephants or whales, but it's kind of hard to come up with other animals that somewhere aren't eaten by some species of snake, okay? And so as a result, we think that snakes are pretty important predators, that they play these important roles in ecosystems. You might be familiar with the idea that a top predator, like maybe a wolf, can have these important effects on its prey, like elk, and that in turn can have effects on the plants that elk eat, um, positive or negative effects. And so we think that snakes might be playing similar roles in certain ecosystems. So if a rattlesnake eats mice, it may contribute to reducing the population of invertebrates that um, are parasites on mice, like these ticks, which spread diseases like Lyme disease to humans like you and me. And so these snakes can potentially play really important roles in ecosystems that benefit humans directly, okay? And there's two kind of good examples of this from snakes that are um, introduced to areas where they're not originally found. One's the brown tree snake, which is um, from Australia, but now it's found on Guam, an island in the Pacific. And this graph is showing uh, Guam here and some other islands that don't have brown tree snakes. And the bar, the height of the bar is showing the number of spiders, okay? And so on Guam, there's no birds or lizards really anymore because brown tree snakes pretty much ate them all because there were no native snakes and the birds nested on the ground, weren't frightened of snakes, got eaten by them. And as a result, there were no spider predators around and so the spider population of Guam has really um, grown. So if you don't like snakes or spiders, Guam is probably not a good choice for your next <laughs> tropical vacation. Uh, a little bit closer to home, um, you may know that we're now um, the United States, Southern Florida, is now home to an introduced population of Burmese pythons. So this is one of the world's largest snakes. It's native to Southeast Asia, but they're, they're established in Everglades National Park now. And this graph is showing, for all these different types of mammals, the green bars show the number of those mammals observed before pythons were found in the Everglades, and the red bars show how many were observed after, which, if you can't see the red bars, you're not alone because there basically aren't 
any native mammals left in the Everglades. They documented like 99% declines in these common species like rabbits, opossums, raccoons. So we don't know yet what effects this is going to have on the ecosystem in the Everglades, but it's probably going to have some kind of important effect. And snakes are, are in this case, responsible, okay? And we think they play these important roles in their native ecosystems too. Okay, so how do snakes actually eat when, they're, when they wanna eat something? So some snakes just cram their prey into their mouth without killing it beforehand. These are usually snakes that eat relatively small, play, relatively small prey or prey that are really long and skinny like another snake and they don't necessarily need to subdue it. But a lot of them kill their prey first using one of two strategies. Um, constriction, which, where they wrap their body around and squeeze until the prey are killed and then they eat them, um, or venom. And this is a very elegant chemical cocktail that they use to, to kill the prey. That way it doesn't harm them when they're trying to ingest it, okay? And that's what the rest of the talk is gonna kind of focus on. Venomous snakes and what their venom does and what, um, and how they can interact with people, okay? So snake venom is, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's essentially very strong saliva that is injected into a prey item in order to kill it. So it's got two functions. Um, the first is procuring food, so killing the prey. And uh, they do that, um, in addition to killing it, they also rapidly immobilize it, right? So they can then eat it. If it does get away, um, research has shown that snakes can actually relocate prey that they've bitten and killed by following the smell of their own venom, which is pretty interesting. So it helps them relocate prey that they've just attacked. Um, and there's some studies that show that it starts, to, starts the digestion process before the prey have actually been ingested, okay? Um, other studies have shown that that's not the case, so it's still kind of up in the air, but at least some, some folks think that that is probably true. The second function is defense against predators, all right? And this is where humans really come into, prey, into play. Uh, we're not prey, we're not, I, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> because we're not actually prey of any venomous snakes and really very, very rarely of any snakes at all. I said there were almost no species of animals that were not eaten by snakes, but if you had to make a list, it'd be a short list, but humans would probably be on it. There may be a few rare exceptions, but no venomous snake on earth is large enough to consider a human being prey, okay? And so when a snake sees a human, they perceive us either you know, as nothing or as a predator. Um, and when they're biting, uh, to defend themselves against predators, they may not bite in the same way that they bite when they're trying to kill their prey. And that's because their venom is kind of expensive for them to create, okay? Um, so when snakes bite to kill their prey, they inject venom 100% of the time, essentially. This is um, well known. It's been shown that they can meter the amount of venom that they inject roughly to correspond to the size of the prey that they're injecting, although that's also something that's a little bit tough to get a handle on. When they're biting in defense, this is a much lower and more variable number, okay? Between eight and 80% of the time, they're injecting venom. It varies a lot based on the species of snake and also on the context of the bite, perhaps how threatened they feel. Um, and here's some data showing that uh, rattlesnakes that were either touched or not by sort of a threatening fake hand injected almost twice as much venom when they were touched as when they weren't. So they probably have some ability to control the amount of venom that they inject and, and make that, um, adjust that to, to be more proper to the context that it's in. Um, on the other hand, so it's a really good study done with cotton mouths. This is a species from the southeastern United States. It's also known as the water moccasin. And these guys, Gibbons and Dorcas, wanted to know, okay, how likely are cotton mouths to actually bite in their self-defense, right? Uh, people in the southeast will tell you that cotton mouths are really aggressive snakes. They'll bite you, you know, they'll go out of their way to bite you or they'll chase you or something like that, okay? A lot of people will tell you that as, as fact. And so what they did is they approached these snakes. They had a fake leg and they also had a fake hand and they would put the leg right next to the snake and watch what it did. And then they'd step on the snake with the fake leg and watch what it did. And then they'd reach out with the fake hand and pick the snake up and watch what it did, okay? And they just recorded, you know, what did these wild cotton mouths do when you approach them in this way that mimicked how a human might approach a snake. So I'll show you two graphs. The first one is the proportion of those cotton mouths that attempted to escape, okay? And you can see it's, it's pretty high. Uh, for these two categories. It's low for the pickup category, and that's because a lot of the snakes that attempted to escape 
actually escaped, and they didn't get a chance to try to pick them up, okay? So it's not that they don't try to escape when you pick them up, it's that escape is a very effective defensive behavior and they're able to escape before you can even you know, escalate the interaction. Here's the data for biting. So of all the snakes that they stood beside, not one of them bit the fake leg, okay? When they stepped on the snakes, about 5% of them bit this fake leg. And finally, when they picked them up, their most aggressive category, 36% of these cotton mouths bit the hand that picked them up. So that's relatively low, right? About a little bit higher than a third. Now, does this mean you should go out and pick up cotton mouths? No, 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 no. That is a very, very stupid idea. You should not do that. But if you, even if you did, even if you were a really dumb person who chose to do this, it's not 100% that one would actually bite you, right? They're not as aggressive as people tend to think that they are. And there is another study done in Florida on pygmy rattlesnakes, this guy, where they, these are really small rattlesnakes, so they pick them up with these heavy gloves. Um, and they showed that only 8% of the over 300, I think it was, pygmy rattlesnake that they picked up actually bit the gloved hand. So really, actually quite low, okay? Now, still don't go out and pick up venomous snakes. It's a really bad idea. But they're not out to get you, right? They're not coming after you. They don't want to bite you. And if you're right by them, they probably actually won't, okay? Um, nevertheless, you know, snake bite is, is a problem. Um, in the U.S., there are about four and a half million bites every year, leading to about 30 deaths, and that is just from dogs, okay? <laughs> so dogs in the U.S. bite about four and a half million people every year, and about 30 of those people die. But no one's out there saying, the only good dog is a dead dog, right? And no, no one's like killing every dog that they see. Not that many people are frightened of dogs. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe they should be. Probably not. Snakes, in contrast, I think you'll be surprised how much lower these are. So snake bite in the USA, there's only about seven to 8,000 snake bites every year in the United States. And of those, only about five of those people die, okay? So that's way less than 1% of venomous snake bite victims die. And we have really good medical care in the United States, so that's part of the reason. Um, but what I will point out is that of those seven to 8,000 bites, anywhere between one half and two thirds of them are caused by what we call intentional exposure, okay? So what that means is that the human in the snake-human interaction knew that the snake was there and decided for some reason to interact with it, to go over and to pick it up or to harass it, or maybe they were trying to kill it, maybe they were showing off to their friends. And so what I take from this is that we could cut venomous snake bite in the US in half if we were willing to modify our own behavior and not be aggressive towards snakes and not choose to interact with venomous snakes, okay? Um, the other thing I'll mention is that this five deaths per year is already really low, but it includes two sort of special categories that don't really quite, in my opinion, count. Um, one of those is people who refuse medical treatment, okay? Now that might sound crazy, but there are people out there who refuse medical treatment for snake bite, um, particularly in the southern Appalachians. There are several sects of Christianity where they handle snakes to prove their faith, and if they're bitten, they're not supposed to be treated, and that's something that they feel very strongly about. And no shock, quite a number of those people end up dying eventually from venomous snakes. If you pick up venomous snakes every single day of your life, or every week at least, eventually one of them is gonna get you. So this is kind of inflating the statistics a little bit. The other one is, um, this also includes bites from captive snakes, um, which might be exotic species from other parts of the world. And so antivenom may not be available for those bites, so medical treatment isn't an option. Either the antivenom doesn't even exist, it hasn't been invented, or it's just not anywhere nearby because no one knew that that snake was in the area, okay? And so five deaths a year probably should be rounded down to four or something like that to account for these two special cases. Um, I don't want to minimize the fact that snake bite is a significant public health concern in certain parts of the world, okay? So worldwide, what you've got here is a graph of sort of your probability of being bitten. So over here, you've got sort of very likely one in a thousand, which is still not very likely, but it's relatively likely compared to sort of down here where you've got, you know, this would probably be about one in a million right here. So here's one in a hundred thousand. This is a log scale. So each of these is 10 times bigger than the one before it. And here you've got your probability of dying given that you have been bitten. So very, very low to almost certain to die. 
and each dot represents an, a country, okay? And so there are some countries like Nepal where a lot of people live in rural areas. There are a pretty good number of venomous snakes. A lot of people are outside working in fields. They don't have shoes on. And so their chance of being bitten is pretty darn high, probably about the highest in the world, okay? Other countries like Bangladesh, their chance of being bitten is sort of intermediate, but medical care is not very good. There's not good access to antivenom. Um, there may not be antivenom for some of those species. And so the chance of dying, given that you've been bitten, is pretty high, okay? The USA, statistically speaking, is by far the safest country in the world in terms of venomous snake bite. As long as you don't include countries like Ireland and New Zealand that don't even have venomous snakes, okay? Those, there's no point for those. There's no point on the graph for those because there can't be. Um, but if you're living in the United States, you are way, way, way safer from venomous snake bite than in any other country in the world, okay? Okay, in Utah, and I'm gonna bring these up for a minute. So I wanna get some guesses. So who wants to give me a guess? How many people do you think are bitten by venomous snakes in Utah every year on average? Yeah, what do you think? Every year, how many people? Three. You think three? Okay, that's pretty low. Any other, any other guesses? One? Man, I already convinced you guys I did a great job. What do you think? <laughs> Two? Okay. So in, in, that, in that range. Um, one more. You? Yeah. Five. Five. Okay. So this is, this is number bit. All right. Now, how many of those people, how many of those people do you think die? What do you think? One. One. Okay. Any other guesses? If there's only five. If there's only five. Now, the, remember, their guesses may not be correct. I'm going to tell you the correct number in just a second. What do you think? This is just in Utah. Zero. Zero, okay. And so I should say this is per year, all right? All right. So what is it really? You guys already guessed. Okay, so there's about 13 bites a year. So it's actually higher than you guys guessed, which I was surprised. I was sure that people were gonna guess higher than 13, but apparently I already did a really good job of convincing you that venomous snake bite is, is really rare. And it is pretty rare, 13 is, is not that much, okay? Um, compared to sort of the national average, we do have a relatively low percentage that are caused by intentional exposure. So remember that a national average is between half and two thirds. In Utah, it's only about a fifth, so about 20%. And I think that's due to the, the high amount of outdoor recreation that happens in Utah, okay? A lot more people are outdoors and they might have the potential to sort of more legitimately encounter a venomous snake if they don't know that it's there, okay? Um, about half of those result in no envenomation. So the snake may or may not inject venom. Remember I showed you eight to 80% in total. And so that's kind of right in the middle. Um, and 90% of those snake bites occur somewhere along the Wasatch Front. So Logan down to Provo. Now, I already showed you that 90% of the snakes in Utah are not along the Wasatch Front, right? Most of them are down around St. George. So what this tells me is that the major driving factor in predicting the number of snake bites is not the number of snakes, it's the number of people, okay? The number of people that are, that are out. Okay, in terms of deaths, you guys guessed some really low numbers, and zero is probably close to the average. So there are six recorded deaths from venomous snake bite in Utah between 1900 and 1990. So in a 90-year period, only six people died from venomous snake bite, which is, is pretty low. Um, of those, half of them were intentionally exposed, so they chose to interact with the venomous snake in some way, and so that's higher than this average, which is sort of suggestive, okay? Um, one, so there's kind of a disclaimer, one was caused by a captive snake in a zoo, and so you could say from wild native venomous snakes, it's only five. And I looked for some more up-to-date statistics on what's going on since 1990, but the Utah Poison Control Center told me that they don't actually keep exact records of deaths from venomous snake bite anymore because it's so rare. So they just lump them in with all other miscellaneous deaths from different kinds of animals, you know, that they don't keep track of specifically. It's a little frustrating to me because I actually really want to know. Um, but it, it does, you know, help my case that they're so rare they don't even keep track of them. Like, all right, it's not probably something you should be losing sleep over. Um, and so what I hope I've kind of convinced you of in general regarding snake bite is that uh, 
Snake bite is very rare. It's very unusual for a person that's not uh, going out of their way to interact with a snake to be bitten and envenomated by a venomous snake. And if you're in the United States, we have such good access to medical care that your chances of dying are almost non-existent, okay? So I'm not saying you should go out and harass venomous snakes or, or choose to interact with them, but if you do get bitten, you're probably not gonna die, okay? Um, and that, I think, helps some people feel a little bit better about their fear of snakes if you have a well-developed fear of snakes. Um, that, that really good medical care is, I should mention this, is anti-venom. So it's chemicals that are uh, created, they used to create it by injecting small amounts of snake venom into a big animal like a horse or a sheep, and then letting that horse's immune system respond to the snake venom. Then they'd harvest the antibodies and give them to a person. Um, that was time consuming, it was expensive, and sometimes people had allergic reactions to those horse serums. And so now they can make it synthetically in the lab, which is a lot better. It's pretty expensive though. The average cost of a snake bite is about $160,000. So if you're already not convinced not to be bitten by a venomous snake, that might help reduce your desire to do so. Um, in case it does happen, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about what you should actually do, okay? So all of these first aid things that you may have heard of, suction devices, tourniquet, cutting the wound, electrical shock, pretty much anything else that anyone ever tells you to do for first aid um, is a bunch of, of uh, it's not true, okay? You shouldn't, <laughs> there is no first aid for a venomous snake bite. The thing to do is to um, go to the hospital, okay? And these suction devices in particular, I think are really misleading because they're advertised as being effective. You can buy these at Smith's, okay? But they don't work. There's this great paper from the medical literature. Snake bite suction devices don't remove venom, they just suck, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so don't use these, they don't work. Um, effective first aid, basically stay calm, have your keys and your phone with you, call the hospital. You know, If you're in a really remote area, they'll send a helicopter, which will probably increase your $160,000 bill, but at least you won't die. Um, so why are people so frightened of snakes? Well, I think they don't know much about them, which hopefully I've done at least a little bit to change that tonight. A lot of people have been taught to fear them, okay, by their, their parents or somebody in their life. And there is also some evidence that fear of snakes might be partially inherent. Um, this is another kind of open question. There's a big debate in the literature right now uh, between people that think that it is inherent and people that think that it's not. Um, and I'll just put in a little plug for another thing that snakes are good for, which is their venom is a pharmacopoeia of compounds that are really useful for treating all kinds of other diseases that many, many, many more people die from than die from venomous snake bite each year. And this table could actually be like five times as big as it is. I just didn't have room to fit them all on there, but there's all kinds of different drugs that have been made from compounds that um, are found in snake venom, okay? Um, so I think snakes are really beautiful, they're really interesting, they're really important, at least to me, and I hope that I've been able to do at least a passable job of convincing you of the same. So um, if you want to know more about snakes, I would encourage you to check out my blog and write a comment on there, ask a question. You can email me directly if you have a more personal question, and if you only read one book about snakes in your life, you should read this one. It's a really good read. With that, I'd be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. What's Question. The, what's the least, dang, the least dangerous snake in the world? The least dangerous snake in the world? Well, about 75% of them are not dangerous at all. So I'd say that all those 2,000 whatever species are all tied for the least dangerous snake, okay? There's, there's no way to choose just one because most of them are completely harmless to you. Um, 30, you know, 25 of the 30 species in Utah are the least dangerous snake in the world. It's a good Please question. Please try yeah. to be quiet if you're walking out so people can hear the questions. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, in the front row right here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they bite four and a half million people a year. <laughs> it doesn't tell you much, yeah. But people do think that they're cute, and I personally think that certain snakes are also are also quite cute. So that's that's a good point. Other questions? Any other? Um, yeah, up here.
Yeah, good question. So is there any connection between the size of the snake and either whether it has venom or the strength of its venom? This is a common thing. So um, baby venomous snakes are born with venom. They start out venomous. They don't have to acquire it. Um, there are differences in the composition of venom over a snake's lifetime because a lot of snakes switch from one type of prey when they're young to another type when they're adults. Um, people often say that young snakes either have more potent venom or they have less control over their venom than adult snakes, but the research doesn't really support that. Um, it's a little bit hard to study because it is complicated. Like it's hard to know what their motivation actually is. But what is definitely true is that smaller snakes have much smaller venom glands than larger snakes. And so the total quantity of venom that they can inject is much lower. And uh, there's a good epidemiological study that showed that the number one predictor of the severity of a snake bite was the size of the snake. So the bigger the snake was, the more severe the bite, the bite because the larger quantity of venom. But um, you should talk to Ryan McCleary about changes over a snake's lifetime in uh, venom composition. Because there are a bunch, but we don't really know how it affects human physiology in terms of a bite. Yeah? yeah how long do snakes live? How long do snakes live? Great question. So it really varies by species. Um, some of the smaller species probably only live a couple years in the wild. Some of the really large species might live a really long time in the wild, maybe 50 or 60 years. In captivity, some of the big pythons can live about that long, so a pretty long time. Yeah? How long does it take for a snake to, to snug something to death? Yeah, to, how long does it take for a snake to, um, to snug something to death? I like that. <laughs> to constrict something? That's a good question. It's pretty quick. Um, it depends on the, the prey and the snake, right? But if they wrap around it and squeeze you know, as tightly as they can and nothing goes wrong, it probably takes maybe 10 minutes or something like that. It's, it's pretty quick. Uh, it also depends on the prey. So some prey, like a mammal, would die pretty quickly because we really need a lot of oxygen. We need to, to be able to breathe. Uh, if a snake was constricting another reptile, that reptile might take a lot longer because they don't need oxygen as much as, as we do. So that's a, a good question. Yeah? How many constrictors do we have in Utah? Um, not a ton. We've probably got about 10-ish mm, species. So probably about a third of the species are constrictors. And then I said five are venomous. And so the remaining 15 probably are just kind of grab it and stuff it in their mouth type snakes. Yeah? Colton. Uh, do you think it's ethical to keep snakes as pets? Wow, that's a loaded question. Do I think it's ethical to keep snakes as pets? Well, I, I do have a snake as a pet, so I must. Um, it, you know, it's a really, it can be a really good thing because it can really, well, we can learn a lot about snakes by keeping them in captivity because we can observe them in ways that we can't in the wild. And that goes for both pets and research. Um, and a lot of people, including myself when I was young, are really interested in keeping them in captivity because we think they're really cool. Um, you know, I don't think they like suffer very much in captivity. They just sit in one spot in the wild anyway. So if they're just sitting in one spot <laughs> in a cage, they're probably not like depressed or anything. You know, there are certain complications. So for instance, there's a lot of debate about whether or not it should be legal to keep certain types of snakes as pets, <laughs> snakes that are potentially dangerous, so venomous snakes or large constrictors, because you're potentially putting a health burden on yourself and people around you and, and sort of the healthcare system that other people may not want. And there's also the possibility that the pet trade could lead to conservation issues like po new populations of species outside their native range. So we're pretty darn sure that the Burmese pythons in the Everglades came from the pet trade, or that wild snakes could be over collected for the pet trade and go extinct as a result. So those are probably the two biggest issues um, in terms of ethics. If they're captive bred and they're non-venomous and you're not releasing them, yeah, it's, it's fine, as long as it's legal, which most states it is. Yeah. Great question. So he asked, what is the most venomous snake? So it's kind of a hard question to answer and there's kind of two answers. So the first answer is that the snake that has the most toxic venom per volume, so the snake where they would take the smallest amount of venom to kill a mouse, which is what they do these studies on, they can't do them in humans, so we kind of extrapolate, is an Australian snake called the inland taipan. However, 
almost nobody ever dies from taipan bites because they're not very aggressive and they live in parts of all the Australian outback where basically nobody lives, okay? So they barely ever kill anybody even though they have this very, very strong venom. Um, the snake that kills the most people is probably the Russell's viper, which is a pretty venomous species of snake that's found in sort of India and Southeast Asia, an area with an awful lot of people and a lot of people living outside. And so that's a, probably the most dangerous species of snake from a human perspective. But it's, it's a good question. Um, yeah, right here. Are there two-headed snakes? So there are no species of snakes that always have two heads, but you get all kinds of weird things when you breed snakes in captivity, and two-headed snakes are one um, consequence of that that can happen. So there are individual two-headed snakes of a bunch of different species probably all over the place, and there are two-headed other kinds of animals as well. Good question. Um, yeah, in the back there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I mean by expensive is that it's energetically expensive for them to produce. So people have done studies where they've milked a venomous snake, they've you know forcibly caused it to eject its venom in captivity, and then they track its metabolic rate over time. And they see this big spike during the first couple of days when it's regenerating this venom. A lot of venom molecules are large, they're complex, they take a lot of energy to put together. And so if the snake is biting to get prey, then it's going to get some energy right away. If it's biting in defense, it's not necessarily going to do that. It's a good question. Yeah. Is a snake immune to its own venom? Is a snake immune to its own venom? Ryan, I'm going to punt that one to you. Are they immune to their own venom? My, my, I want to say no. <laughs> uh, generally no, um, but it, it's very dependent. Um, you can see within the same species, if one bites another one, that one will die, or can die. But whether they have um, any kind of immunity, that's not really looking. Yeah, we're still learning a lot about those types of questions, so that's, that's a good question. How about right here? What's the biggest snake? So probably the longest snake is either the Burmese python or the reticulated python, which are both found in Southeast Asia. Uh, the heaviest snake is the green anaconda, so it's not as long, but it's heavier, and those are South America. Um, let's see, I, w I wanna get you, but I wanna get people that haven't asked one yet, like you in the back over here. How many eggs do snakes lay? Great question. So um, again, it really varies from species to species, and not all snakes lay eggs. Some of them actually give birth to live babies. A lot of the ones in northern Utah, like, like rattlesnakes as well as garter snakes, give birth to live babies. Um, some snakes give birth to as many as 100 at a time. That's high. The average is probably between 15 and 30, I would guess, across all species. Some have smaller clutches. Some blind snakes, I think, only have maybe two or three at a time or something like that. Um, so it, it really varies a lot. And it probably varies throughout their life too. A bigger, older female can probably lay more eggs than a female that's reproducing for the first time. Yeah? Uh, is it true that if a snake is threatened, it will bite once and not inject any venom and then bite again? Um, so people have looked at that. It seems to vary a lot. Uh, I would not say that it is true. There might be something to that, like as the threat level increases, they're more likely to inject venom or inject more venom or something like that. It's really hard to study that kind of thing. So the real answer is we don't really know. It could be, but it might not be. Denise. What's your favorite kind of snake? What's my favorite kind of snake? I was hoping someone would ask that question. Um, it's really hard to narrow it down because as my girlfriend Kendall will tell you every time I tell her about a species of snake, I always say, I always preface it with, oh, this is the coolest snake, you know? So they're all the coolest. But um, I'd say the one that I've loved the most for the longest is the Gaboon Viper. It's a huge species of viper from Africa. And the reason I like them is just their pattern is so beautiful. It's so geometric and it's so intricate. And I actually have a quilt that my mom made for me that is the pattern of a Gaboon Viper. <laughs> so it's really cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, you. Uh, have you ever been bitten by a snake or have you ever killed a snake? Yeah, good question. So have I ever been bitten by a snake or have I ever killed a snake? So um, I've never been bitten by a venomous snake, okay? Um, 
I've been bitten by thousands of non-venomous snakes. And it doesn't hurt that much. It kind of feels just like a briar scratch. Um, I have killed a few snakes, mostly for my research. Sometimes we euthanize snakes in research in order to dissect them or learn more about them. Um, I've never killed a snake like out of anger or sort of a, a wild snake on purpose. I did run a snake over with my car one time, and I was really sad about that. But I usually try to be really careful about that. Yeah. That's a really good question. So she asked, when you have a two-headed snake, is it possible for one head to be a male and the other head to be a female? Um, so the answer is no, because what makes them male or female is in their DNA, and it's also in their reproductive organs, which are not in their head. So they would both be physiologically the same sex. But there is a really interesting study about a two-headed snake that had two very different personalities. The one head was very dominant and would always be the head that ate, and the other head would sort of not do as much, which is kind of, most snakes don't do that much, so it's hard to know like what is the snake with a lot of personality, right? But there seemed to be a lot of difference between these two heads, which is really quite interesting. So, yeah. So in Utah, how many species of venomous snakes are there exactly? There are five species, and it's the five that I showed you. And your other question was? No, I was saying in Australia. In Australia. So almost all of the species of snakes in Australia are venomous. And I think there's about, it's the only part of the world where that's true. Um, I think there's about six or 700 species in Australia, so the answer is about six or 700. There are a few that are not. So that's the majority of the world's venomous snakes. And Nancy's coming up here, which I think means that we're probably about out of time for questions. But if you have a question, I'd love to answer it. So please come down here and ask me face-to-face -face right afterwards. Okay, so thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot.